John Tyler was born on March 29, 1790 to a prominent slave-owning Virginia family in Charles City County. His father, John Tyler Sr., was a political friend and college roommate of Thomas Jefferson and served in the Virginia House of Delegates. Tyler became a state court judge, later governor of Virginia, and a judge on the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia at Richmond. His wife, Mary Marat Armistead, was the daughter of prominent New Kent County plantation owner Robert Booth Armistead. Tyler was raised on Greenway Plantation, a 1,200-acre estate with a manor house built by his father. At age 12, he entered the preparatory branch of the College of William and Mary, graduating in 1807. Tyler's economic views were shaped by Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations and his love for William Shakespeare. Bishop James Madison served as a second father and mentor to Tyler. Tyler read the law with his father, then a state judge, and later with Edmund Randolph, former United States Attorney General. Tyler, a 19-year-old Virginia barrister, started his legal practice in Richmond, where his father was governor. According to the 1810 federal census, Tyler owned eight slaves in Richmond, possibly five in Henrico County, and 26 in Charles City County. After his father's death in 1813, Tyler purchased the Woodburn Plantation, where he lived until 1821. As of 1820, Tyler owned 24 enslaved persons at Woodburn, after inheriting 13 from his father. However, only eight were listed as engaged in agriculture in the census. At 21, Tyler was elected to represent Charles City County in the House of Delegates in 1811. He served five consecutive terms, supporting states' rights and opposing a national bank. Tyler supported the censure of U.S. Senators William Branch Giles and Richard Brent of Virginia, who voted for the recharter of the First Bank of the United States, against Virginia legislature instructions. He also served on the Courts and Justice Committee. Tyler, a Southern American anti-British, advocated for military action during the War of 1812. After the British capture of Hampton, Virginia, he organized the Charles City Rifles to defend Richmond, which he commanded as a captain. However, no attack occurred, and the company was dissolved two months later. Tyler received a land grant for his military service. After his father's death, Tyler inherited 13 slaves and his plantation. In 1816, he resigned his legislative seat to serve on the Governor's Council of State. In 1816, the death of U.S. Representative John Clopton created a vacancy in Virginia's 23rd Congressional District, which Tyler sought to fill. He narrowly won the election and was sworn into the 14th Congress as a Democratic Republican. Tyler's strict constructionist beliefs led him to reject proposals for a stronger central government after the War of 1812. He believed each state should construct necessary projects within its borders using locally generated funds. Tyler participated in an audit of the Second Bank of the United States in 1818, where he was appalled by corruption within the bank. He argued for the revocation of the bank charter, although Congress rejected any such proposal. Tyler's first clash with General Andrew Jackson occurred during the First Seminole War, and he condemned him for the execution of two British subjects. The 16th Congress, 1819-1821, focused on whether Missouri should be admitted to the Union and whether slavery would be permitted in the new state. Tyler hoped that allowing slavery to expand would lead to fewer slaves in the East and make it possible to abolish it in Virginia. However, Tyler believed Congress did not have the power to regulate slavery and that admitting states based on their status was a recipe for sectional conflict. Tyler declined to seek renomination in late 1820 due to his frequently ill health. He privately acknowledged his dissatisfaction with the position as his opposing votes were largely symbolic and did little to change the political culture in Washington. He left office on March 3, 1821 endorsing his former opponent Stevenson for the seat and returning to private law practice full-time. In 1823, 
Tyler sought election to the House of Delegates and was elected easily, finishing first among three candidates. He faced debates about the upcoming presidential election in December, which he tried to convince the lower house to endorse the caucus system and choose William H. Crawford as the Democratic-Republican candidate. However, his proposal was defeated. Tyler's most enduring effort during this second legislative tenure was saving the College of William and Mary, which risked closure due to waning enrollment. Tyler proposed administrative and financial reforms which were passed into law and achieved its highest enrollment by 1840. Tyler's political fortunes increased and he was considered a possible candidate for the 1824 U.S. Senate election. He was nominated for governor of Virginia in December 1825 and was elected 131 to 81 over John Floyd. The office of governor was powerless under the original Virginia Constitution, 1776 to 1830, lacking even veto authority. Tyler's most visible act as governor was delivering the funeral address for former President Jefferson, who had died on July 4, 1826. Tyler's governorship was uneventful, promoting states' rights and opposing any concentration of federal power. He suggested Virginia actively expand its road system to thwart federal infrastructure proposals. He was unanimously re-elected to a second one-year term in December 1826. In 1829, Tyler was elected as a delegate to the Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1829 to 1830, serving alongside Chief Justice John Marshall, Philip N. Nicholas, and John B. Clopton. Tyler served in various capacities at a state level, including president of the Virginia Colonization Society and later as rector and chancellor of the College of William and Mary. In January 1827, the General Assembly voted on whether to elect U.S. Senator John Randolph for a six-year term. Randolph, a contentious figure with a reputation for fiery rhetoric and erratic behavior, had made enemies by opposing President John Quincy Adams and Kentucky Senator Henry Clay. The Democratic Republican Party, which supported Adams and Clay, sought to unseat Randolph by capturing the vote of states' rights supporters. Tyler, a Democratic maverick, declined the offer and eventually agreed to accept the seat. However, supporters argued that Tyler's election would be a tacit endorsement of the Adams administration. Tyler was selected in a vote of 115 to 110 and resigned his governorship on March 4, 1827, as his Senate term began. Tyler, a prominent national political figure, was involved in the 1828 presidential campaign, which saw incumbent President Adams challenged by Andrew Jackson. Tyler disliked both candidates for their commitment to increasing federal government power but was drawn to Jackson, hoping that he would not spend as much federal money on internal improvements. He served alongside Virginia colleague Littleton Waller Tazewell, who shared his strict constructionist views and uneasy support of Jackson. Throughout his tenure, Tyler vigorously opposed national infrastructure bills, believing these were matters for individual states to decide. He unsuccessfully opposed the protectionist tariff of 1828, known as the Tariff of Abominations, and suggested that the tariff's only positive outcome would be a national political backlash, restoring respect for states' rights. Tyler was at odds with President Jackson, frustrated by Jackson's spoils system and voting against many of his nominations when they appeared unconstitutional or motivated by patronage. In some matters, Tyler was on good terms with Jackson, defending him for vetoing the Maysville Road Funding Project and confirming several of Jackson's appointments, including his future running mate Martin Van Buren as United States Minister to Britain. The leading issue in the 1832 presidential election was the recharter of the Second Bank of the United States, which both Tyler and Jackson opposed. Congress voted to recharter the bank in July 1832, and Jackson vetoed the bill for constitutional and practical reasons. Tyler voted to sustain the veto and endorsed Jackson in his successful bid for re-election. Tyler's relationship with his party deteriorated during the 22nd Congress, as the nullification crisis of 1832 to 1833 began.
South Carolina passed the Ordinance of Nullification in November 1832, declaring the tariff of abominations null and void within its borders. This raised the constitutional question of whether states could nullify federal laws. Jackson, who denied such a right, prepared to sign a force bill allowing the federal government to use military action to enforce the tariff. Tyler, who sympathized with South Carolina's reasons for nullification, rejected Jackson's use of military force against a state and gave a speech in February 1833 outlining his views. He supported Clay's Compromise Tariff, enacted that year, to gradually reduce the tariff over 10 years, alleviating tensions between the states and the federal government. Tyler knew that voting against the force bill would permanently alienate the pro-Jackson faction of the Virginia legislature, even those who had tolerated his irregularity up to this point. This jeopardized his re-election in February 1833, which he faced the pro-administration Democrat James McDowell. With Clay's endorsement, Tyler was re-elected by a margin of 12 votes. Jackson further offended Tyler by moving to dissolve the bank by executive fiat. In September 1833, Jackson issued an executive order directing Treasury Secretary Roger B. Taney to transfer federal funds from the bank to state chartered banks immediately. Tyler saw this as a flagrant assumption of power, a breach of contract, and a threat to the economy. After months of agonizing, Tyler decided to join with Jackson's opponents and voted for two censure resolutions against the president in March 1834. The Democrats took control of the Virginia House of Delegates, and Tyler was offered a judgeship in exchange for resigning his seat. He understood that the legislature would soon force him to vote against his constitutional beliefs. By mid-February, he felt that his Senate career was likely at an end. He issued a letter of resignation to Vice President Van Buren on February 29, 1836, stating that he would carry with him the principles he brought with him into public life. Tyler, a prominent national political figure, was nominated as a vice presidential candidate in the 1836 presidential election. The Virginia Whigs, a faction of the Whig Party, had a weak coalition. With Massachusetts Whigs nominating Daniel Webster and Francis Granger, the anti-Masons supporting William Henry Harrison and Granger, and states' rights advocates nominating Hugh Lawson White and John Tyler. Tyler hoped to be one of the top two vote-getters, which would be chosen by the Senate under the Twelfth Amendment. Tyler stayed home throughout the campaign and made no speeches. He received only 47 electoral votes from Georgia, South Carolina, and Tennessee, trailing Granger and Democratic candidate Richard Mentor Johnson. Harrison was the leading Whig candidate for president, but lost to Van Buren. The presidential election was settled by the Electoral College, but the vice presidential election was decided by the Senate, which selected Johnson over Granger on the first ballot. Tyler a U.S. Senator from Virginia, served as a member of the State Constitutional Convention from October 1829 to January 1830. The original Virginia Constitution gave outsize influence to the state's conservative eastern counties, but Tyler supported the existing system but remained on the sidelines to avoid alienating any political factions. He focused on his Senate career and gave speeches during the convention promoting compromise and unity. After the 1836 election, Tyler thought his political career was over and planned to return to private law practice. In 1837, he sold a sizable property in Williamsburg and successfully sought election to the House of Delegates, taking his seat in 1838. His third delegate service touched on national issues such as the sale of public lands. Tyler's successor in the Senate was conservative Democrat William Cabell Reeves. In February 1839, the General Assembly considered who should fill the vacant Senate seat, which was to expire the following month. Rives had drifted away from his party, signaling a possible alliance with the Whigs. Tyler expected the Whigs to support him, but many Whigs found Rives a more politically expedient choice to ally with the conservative wing of the Democratic Party in the 1840 presidential election. With the vote split among three candidates, the Senate seat remained vacant for almost two years until January 1841. 
in 1839, the Whig National Convention in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, chose the party's ticket amid a recession following the Panic of 1837. The head of the Whig ticket, Harrison, Clay, and General Winfield Scott, sought the nomination. Tyler attended the convention and was with the Virginia delegation, although he had no official status. Due to bitterness over the unresolved Senate election, the Virginia delegation refused to make Tyler its favorite son candidate for vice president. Tyler did nothing to aid his chances, and if his favored candidate for the presidential nomination, Clay, was successful, he would likely not be chosen for the second place on the ticket, which would probably go to a northerner to assure geographic balance. The convention deadlocked among the three main candidates, with Virginia's votes going to Clay, Many Northern Whigs opposed Clay, and some, including Pennsylvania's Thaddeus Stevens, showed the Virginians a letter by Scott in which he apparently displayed abolitionist sentiments. The influential Virginia delegation announced that Harrison was its second choice, causing most Scott supporters to abandon him in favor of Harrison, who gained the presidential nomination. Tyler was considered a logical candidate as a Southern slave owner, balanced the ticket, and assuaged fears of Southerners who felt Harrison might have abolitionist leanings. He had been a vice presidential candidate in 1836, and having him on the ticket might win Virginia, the most populous state in the South. Tyler was accused of having gained the nomination by concealing his views, but his biographer, Robert Seeger II, held that he was selected because of a dearth of alternative candidates. The Whig Party, led by George Harrison and William Tyler, faced opposition from Van Buren and his Democrats for the recession. They initially hoped to muzzle Harrison and Tyler, but after Tyler's Democratic rival, Vice President Johnson, made a successful speaking tour, Tyler was called upon to address a local convention in Columbus, Ohio. He made speeches at rallies, but was eventually asked to admit that he supported the compromise tariff. -er. To win the election, Whig leaders decided to mobilize people across the country, including women who could not vote. This was the first time an American political party included women in campaign activities on a widespread scale. Women in Tyler's Virginia were active on his behalf. The party hoped to avoid issues and win through public enthusiasm with torchlight processions and alcohol-fueled political rallies. The log cabin campaign was born when the Democratic press depicted Harrison as an old soldier who would turn aside from his campaign if given a barrel of hard cider to drink in his log cabin. The Whigs eagerly seized on the image, focusing on Harrison's military service and the well-known campaign jingle, Tip a Canoe and Tyler Two. Glee clubs sprouted all over the country, singing patriotic and inspirational songs. Clay, embittered by another defeat for the presidency, was appeased by Tyler's withdrawal from the Senate race and campaigning in Virginia for the Harrison-Tyler ticket. Tyler predicted the Whigs would easily take Virginia, but was consoled by an overall victory. Van Buren took only seven states out of 26. The Whigs gained control of both houses of Congress. As vice president-elect, John Tyler remained in Williamsburg, hoping that Harrison would prove decisive and prevent intrigue in the cabinet during the first days of the administration. Tyler did not participate in selecting the cabinet or recommend anyone for federal office in the new Whig administration. Harrison was beset by office seekers and the demands of Senator Clay, who sent Tyler letters asking his advice on whether a Van Buren appointee should be dismissed. Tyler recommended against this, and Harrison wrote, Mr. Tyler says they ought not to be removed, and I will not remove them. Tyler was sworn in on March 4, 1841, and delivered a three-minute speech about states' rights before swearing in the new senators and attending Harrison's inauguration. After the inauguration, Tyler returned to the Senate to receive the president's cabinet nominations and presiding over the confirmations the following day. He then left Washington, expecting few responsibilities. Returning to his home in Williamsburg, Harrison struggled to keep up with the demands of Clay and others seeking offices and influence in his administration. His age and fading health were no secret during the campaign, and the question of presidential succession was on every politician's mind. After being caught in a rainstorm in late March, Harrison fell ill with pneumonia and pleurisy. 
Tyler decided not to travel to Washington, not wanting to appear unseemly in anticipating his death. The death of Harrison in office led to significant uncertainty about presidential succession. The United States Constitution, which governed intra-term presidential succession at the time, stated that the actual office of president devolved upon the vice president. Tyler, who was sworn in as president immediately after Harrison's death, asserted that the Constitution gave him the full and unqualified powers of the office. This set a critical precedent for an orderly transfer of power following a president's death, though it was not codified until the passage of the 25th Amendment in 1967. Tyler, at 51, became the youngest president to that point, surpassing his immediate successor, James Polk. Fearing that he would alienate Harrison's supporters, Tyler decided to keep Harrison's entire cabinet, even though several members were openly hostile to him and resented his assumption of the office, Tyler delivered an informal written inaugural address to Congress on April 9th, reasserting his belief in fundamental tenets of Jeffersonian democracy and limited federal power.